A tiny little aquarium ear pump that I bought a while back, thinking it might be the new Pizza Electric style. And certainly it's kind of interesting that it's got a separate sort of power supply module feeding the pump itself. And the specifications for this are uh, 0.9 watt, output 0.45 litres a minute, so about half a litre a minute, uh, and noise less than 35 decibels. And it is very quiet. Let me uh, grab the hoppy here. I'm going to use the hoppy because it's very hard to fit these tiny pins into the standard uh, death adapter, but they do seem to fit in the hoppy quite well. So let's uh, get the hoppy to power up here. I shall plug it in. That's it running. It is very quiet. Uh, 7 milliamps, 1.5 watts, and about 0.8 power factor, which isn't too bad. So, uh, yeah, okay, it's quite quiet. It comes with the ear stone hose. There's airflow. I couldn't tell you how much airflow there is. We'll just have to believe the specification. But uh, let's open it up, since that's what we're going to do with this inevitably. So uh, I'm guessing that under this label is probably a screw. Yes, there is. thought there might have actually been one central screw, but it's off to the side. What's going to be in here? Because uh, if it's a switch mode, if it is pizza electric, it might be a little switch mode power supply. I have to say, uh, the pronunciation of pizza is probably a bit suspect. When I was young, uh, I uh, was taught it was pronounced pizza, as in P-E-E-T-Z-O. But uh, I'm not so sure. It's, it's not pronounced piezo. I think it is piezo. I'm guessing it's Italian. Not sure. A lot of the work... Ooh. Uh, that is hot melt glued in. That's a bit annoying. Let's see if I can just uh, fudge through this hot melt glue without destroying anything. This may take a, a moment. I may have to pause momentarily to get rid of that hot melt glue. It is walled in. Let me just uh, let me show you this. So we've got some big resistors in there. Big resistors, big blob of hot melt glue, a capacitor, what looks like a small inductor, and then a discharge resistor with a capacitor, maybe? Right, okay, just give me a second. I'm going to uh, pause momentarily. I'm going to pop this uh, out. Okay, so here's part one of the puzzle. There's already a design fault in this, a really weird thing. Uh, the resistors here are in series. It's just a simple resistive dropper. It's got quite a low load, and by the time the main supply has gone in and gone, gone out again, it's got, been reduced from about 240 volts to about 130 volts. And I'm guessing maybe this is just a, a cheap way of allowing the same pump to get used on 120 volts uh, on a 240 volt supply just by using uh, resistors in, in the plug here. The resistors aren't dissipating a lot of power. So it's got the three resistors in parallel, a uh, series, should I say, and then a capacitor. I'm guessing it's a suppression capacitor for just whatever reason. Uh, it's 630 volt, 10 nanofarad, and they've got a 150 micro Henry inductor there as well, just this little inductor here. There is a resistor, a 1 mega ohm resistor, which looks as though it should be across the capacitor, but in reality they've put it across one of the resistors. I don't know why they've done that. There's no logical reason they'd do that. It just looks like an error, it's all, almost as if maybe they intended that to actually be down here instead and just act as a discharge resistor for any capacitance in the circuit. Very odd, strange. It's a little design error that possibly alludes to this being a clone. Not sure. The resistors get warm. They're not being super uh, pushed. The rating of the resistors, I'd guess, is generously, I'd say, about, you know, two or three watts. Um, but they're only being run at about half a watt. So they don't, they get hot because of just general, the nature of uh, resistors with passive cooling. They will always tend to get hot before the sort of, you get a balance between the radiated and convected heat. Uh, however, that's going to be closed in a little plastic enclosure. So it's going to get quite warm in there. But anyway, that is the first instalment of that. So let's uh, go into the unit next. Let's uh, bring the focus up just a little bit higher here using cheap focus targets. Let's pull the air hose off. Worth mentioning this uh, clip can go on either way around. There is a tiny little port. I'm guessing that's the air inlet port. So let's see how this comes apart. I can see, I thought this was glued here, but I can actually see a slight lip there. I don't know if this is going to pop off. I suppose there's one way to find out, and that's to try and pop it off. This is where I burst it, isn't it? 
Ooh, that is not wanting to pop off. I have a horrible feeling this may be terminal for this little pump. But uh, this is why I bought it. It's so I can open it up and then you don't have to open it up yourself if you want to get one of these. I have a horrible feeling this thing is glued shut. I may have to use unreasonable force. It's already made, making plaintive cracking noises. I'm not sure that it's supposed to be making plaintive cracking noises. I don't see any sign of screws or anything that I could take out. I may have to put this in the vice of knowledge and give it a quick squeeze. I think I shall put it in the vice of knowledge and give it a quick squeeze and see if I can crunch it open a bit. Oops. Other way, other way, spin. Let's just squeeze the case a little bit, or quite a big bit actually. No, it's, it's not making cracking noises yet, that's a bit disappointing. Pretty sure that may have been ultrasonically welded. Hmm. I shall give it another squeeze, and if I'm not getting any luck, I shall go and take it out to a hard surface and tap it gently with a hammer to persuade it to open. A little bit of hot X reaction. This is not yielding results yet. Okay, I think I'm going to go and have to uh, gently nudge this with a hammer. I'll be back in a moment. I have X rayed it. It appears to be full of air. This is because it's an air pump. Uh, let's see, am I going to get any further in here? I may actually have to remove this bit to get in. Uh, this might be a little bit tougher. I may have to go out and smack with the hammer again. There's no nice way to put it. I think that is about to get prized with screwdriver and thoroughly tapped about because this thing is well glued together. I don't think this is going back together again. Uh, shall we... Shall we use, just use brute force right now? Yes, let's use brute force. Let's bring in my schnips here. Oh, uh, a big screwdriver, big flat blade screwdriver. Do I have such a thing here? No, I don't. Uh, not here, because all the big screwdrivers like that are through in my other workshop for the big boy work. This is uh, having better results. It's piezoelectric. That is very, very interesting indeed. It's just a disc of piezoelectric material that is driving a diaphragm up and down, I guess. How is this fastened in? I'm going to tame the exposure down a bit here because it is just a wee bit ferocious at the moment, particularly with that reflective object. Let's uh, just nudge it like that and try and tame it down. But I'm competing with black versus piezoelectric disc here. This is fascinating. I wasn't kind of... I kind of thought this was just going to be an inductive one. But it appears to be a pizza electric disc vibrating up and down. And that's the only thing that's moving. It's just two valves. And that is it. That... I wouldn't have thought there'd be enough deflection. That is extraordinary. Keep in mind this uh, diaphragm is effectively live at mains voltage when it's in use. Because uh, whichever way around that's plugged, one of these legs is coming straight to the output. So why then have they got that filtering? Maybe it's to protect the disc from transients and spikes. That's a good possibility that they are pre-filtering it. And it's just to clip with this capacitor. Uh, the resistors limit the current and the capacitor just clips any spikes. And then, of course, the inductor in series just protect it further. How interesting. And fundamentally, that's all there is to see. It is just a piezoelectric disc vibrating up and down. Oh, let me let me demonstrate what, what the way a piezoelectric disc works. Let's bring the notepad in again. Piezoelectric discs are used in those sounders. You know, they, they make that sort of high-pitched whistling noise. And they're basically the metal disc and then a layer of crystal and then a coating on it. And the crystal is a voltage is applied across and it's heated up to its Curie point and then it's cooled down. It holds that memory of that voltage. And when you apply, uh, when you flex the disc, if I was to just flex this now, that's generating a small voltage. But when you apply voltage to it, it will actually cause the disc to deflect up and down. So it'll curve up that way and then it'll curve down that way, but only a tiny amount. 
And they're relying on that just tiny amount at mains frequency, in our case 50 hertz, in America's case 60 hertz, to generate that sort of tiny airflow that just uh, is controlled by these flaps that must respond very, very quickly to that tiny amount of air movement. Let's see if we can get the... Let's get in closer and see if we can get these out. This is where black is just not a great colour for filming because uh, because it's very black, fundamentally. So we've got a little plug in here. That is based on a little plug with a hole up the middle. Not sure if I'm going to get that out because it is very soft silicon. It's basically, let me doodle this again. It's a little plug that comes up like that and it's got a hole up the middle and then it's just split down there so that that flaps open and close so that when the air is going through that way, it just pushes these apart and then when it's another way, it closes them again. What's the other one? Same again. So two identical little plugs, so get one out here, that just part, like like piss flaps, really. They're just tiny little uh, thing that parts there, it's got a tiny slot in it, and it lets it out and then closes again. That's just extraordinarily simple, isn't it? And I'm guessing that in America, if they've got anything in, a, in the little plug, they might just run it direct off 120 volts. But if they've got anything, it might just be an uh, interference suppressor to try and maybe take the transients off and protect the disc. That's interesting. Very interesting. Then all you've got after that is this little reservoir here uh, just to act as a buffer, I guess, and allow it to uh, build up the pressure to push along the air line uh, and out the stone. Because without that, without the uh, air diaphragm, it might actually just, that tiny amount of airflow, it might just buffer in the tube and it might never actually be able to push a decent about air, amount of air flow through. But with this reservoir, it's like, uh, what do they call those things? Uh, pneumatic rams, the ones where the they rely on water hammer to push air and they've got a little uh, diaphragm uh, inside and an air sort of air pressure vessel to try and keep pressure on that to even it out and it's almost like an air capacitor if you will it just holds a, a consistent pressure in here for pushing out very interesting without that all oh, they could have actually made this thing super wafer thin it could have been about half as thick but uh, it kind of needs that as the buffer to make it work so there you go a piezoelectric air pump that relies purely on this piezoelectric disc flexing backwards and forwards to actually move the air that is fascinating. A little correction. I thought this reservoir was an output side, but this little plug here, this is actually the output side. And the reason it's got a plug is just to allow easy manufacture of this because that's the actual outlet port there. So when the diaphragm is pushing down the way and it compresses the air, it lets it out into the output here and that's just a closed cavity and then it pushes it along the hose. The air inlet is odd because uh, the air comes in this tiny, tiny little hole in this and it comes in at the back just over the cable port here by the look of it. If I'm getting that right, I think I am. Uh, and that then comes through that hole where the cables are going through, finds its way through this cavity here and uh, this is the, the input side. I'm wondering if there's some resonant cavity thing going on here. I wonder if it has to be this size or it could be made much smaller. Or maybe that's a safety feature to give it a longer path, although I wouldn't expect because it is fairly close to the diaphragm, the live diaphragm, uh, after it's gone through that hole. Uh, I was just thinking if water ended up getting through the thing. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing there must be a reason they've made it so big. Is it purely because uh, it facilitates the manufacture and it allows them to fit in these sort of deeper uh, ports, the, the air valves and the sort of outlet pipe? Or is there a reason? Is it is it a natural physical cavity designed to uh, buffer the air and make it easier for the 
disc to uh, blow that air through. If it is, then it must have taken quite a lot of experimentation to actually get that. But yeah, very, very interesting. Very interesting detail. If you enjoy this type of video, this sort of tear apart and analysis, uh, then remember to subscribe because I do produce quite a lot of these videos.